Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final round of the third annual CSU Grad Slam. My name is Dr. Tracy Love, and I am the Dean of the College of Graduate Studies at San Diego State University. As is tradition at San Diego State University, we begin our meetings recognizing that we are on the traditional territory of the Kumeyaay by reading our land acknowledgement. We stand upon a land that carries the footsteps of millennia of Kumeyaay people. They are a people whose traditional life ways intertwine with a worldview of earth and sky in a community of living beings. This land is part of a relationship that has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced the Kumeyaay people to the present day. It is part of a worldview founded in the harmony of the cycles of the sky and balance in the forces of life. For the Kumeyaay, red and black represent the balance of those forces that provide for harmony within our bodies as well as the world around us. As students, faculty, staff, and alumni of San Diego State University, we acknowledge this legacy from the Kumeyaay. We promote this balance in life as we pursue our goals of knowledge and understanding. We find inspiration in the Kumeyaay spirit to open our minds and hearts. It is the legacy of the red and black. It is the land of the Kumeyaay. Iai Ihun, my heart is good. We would like to begin the final round with two messages. The first is from San Diego State University President Adela De La Torre. Oh, hold on. We're not having the audio coming in. Um, Pat, I'm wondering if you can stop sharing, reshare, and make sure that you click on the share sound button at the bottom. Apologies, all. Just give us one sec. Welcome to the 20. <laughs> Hello, I'm Adela de la Torre, the president of San Diego State University. Welcome to the 2023 California State University Grad Slam. We are honored to host this year's event and to celebrate research excellence across the 23 campuses of the CSU system. The CSU chose an ideal year to bring this celebration of research to San Diego State University. As SDSU continues to celebrate its 125th anniversary, we're honoring the success of generations of students, faculty and staff. Our faculty received the highest amount of research grants in university history last year. $164.5 million, and we're breaking ground this year on a new 1.5 million square foot innovation district at SDSU Mission Valley. The innovation district will be an epicenter for research and partnerships with industry leading businesses and a launch pad for our students into exciting careers. You have come to a campus that embraces research and supports the success of students in everything we do. These are core parts of our mission and our identity at SDSU. Through exciting programs like the Grad Slam, I'm confident that the CSU's best and brightest minds will identify and determine how to solve some of the great challenges of our time, making our society and world a better place. To the students participating in this year's Grad Slam, I extend my heartfelt congratulations on behalf of SDSU's faculty, staff, students, and alumni. What an honor and accomplishment it is to be selected as one of only two students from each campus and from among nearly half a million CSU students statewide. You are truly remarkable, as are the faculty members who have mentored and supported you along the way. I extend a heartfelt congratulations to them as well. While I confess in rooting for our Aztecs in this and every competition, I truly wish each and every one of you the best of luck. Again, Welcome to the 2023 California State University Grad Slam. A 
And our next message is from Dr. Sylvia Alva, who is the Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic and Faculty Affairs for the CSU system. Good afternoon, and thank you, President De La Torre, for that kind introduction. On behalf of the entire Cal State community, I am thrilled to welcome you to one of my favorite events of the year, the CSU Grad Slam 2023. I'm Dr. Sylvia Alba, Executive Vice Chancellor of Academic and Student Affairs for the CSU and I'm honored to help kick off today's competition. This is an exciting opportunity for the CSU's best and brightest graduate students to demonstrate their knowledge, creativity, and skills of persuasion, and for all of us to celebrate the interesting and innovative research and scholarship happening across our 23 universities. When I was a first-generation Cal State student, the improbable became possible when a faculty member in my department invited me to work with her on a research project as part of my undergraduate experience. I was hooked, and so she encouraged me to apply to the doctoral program at UCLA. And I have to tell you, she saw in me something that I did not see in myself at the time. That incredible experience and the mentors I was privileged to work with gave me a sense of belonging and confidence as a scholar and inspired my lifelong love of learning and a deeply held belief that the improbable is possible. Research, scholarship, and creative activities help our students develop purpose, perseverance, and collaboration. They connect our scholars with invaluable mentors and help them build the specialized knowledge and creative thinking skills that are required for today's in-demand careers. To our competitors here today, through your research, you're discovering not only advances Looks like some more technical difficulties. We'll see if we can get back to where we were. If not, we'll just move on. I think we'll move on to the next slide. <laughs> so I, I do want to uh, join President De La Torre and Executive Vice Chancellor Alva in welcoming all of you to today's event. I especially welcome all of our student participants here with us today, as well as their family and friends. We are so glad to have you here. I'd like to take a moment to welcome all of our colleagues and campus representatives from, th from throughout the Cal State system, as well as the friends of California higher education that are here today. It is wonderful that you could join us. And last, but certainly not least, I am delighted to welcome our judges. Our first judge is Dr. Brent Foster from the California State University System. Welcome, Dr. Foster. Can you, can you unmute yourself and say a quick hello? Hello, everybody. Happy Friday, and thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this really cool opportunity. Look forward to it. Thank you. Our second judge is Raji Brar. Ms. Brar, can you turn on your camera and unmute yourself and say a quick hi? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm honored to be here today. Uh, this is my first official uh, event as a CSU Board of Trustee member, so I'm very honored and excited. But I've also judged a Grand Slam before at CSU Bakersfield a few years back. So it's always an amazing day, these students what they come up with in their research is just extraordinary. So I'm looking forward to meeting everyone and, and looking at these wonderful projects. Thank you so much and welcome and congratulations on your new appointment to the board. Thank you so much. And our third judge is Ms. Julia Lopez. Can you unmute yourself and say a hello to everyone? 
Hello, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, delighted to meet Raj for the first time, even if it's virtually. I'm really looking forward to uh, the contest here. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your participation in this third annual event for the CSU system. I'd like to turn now and introduce our moderator for the rest of the finals, Ms. Tammy Blackburn. Tammy is a double alumna of San Diego State University and serves as the Senior Director of Marketing and Communications for University Relations and Development. When Tammy was here as a student, she was a member of the SDSU women's Aztec basketball team and since then has gone on to moonlight as a sports broadcaster for Fox Sport, ESPN, CBS, and Pac-12. She has served as a moderator and a host for events throughout the United States. And we welcome you, Tammy, and I will turn the mic over to you. Well, thank you so very much for allowing me to do this in the invite. This is a truly a thrill and quite an honor for me to serve uh, in this capacity. You know, I have great admiration for Grad Slam due to its multitude of virtues with its foremost attribute being the ability, I think, to serve as an enjoyable, I think you'd all agree that it's an enjoyable platform, um, but it's also an imaginative platform to showcase the remarkable, what I call endeavors of our very gifted graduate students. And we, as we are all aware, I think the CSU excels so nicely in providing these avenues for graduate education, and I know it did for me as well, which extends this unwavering support to our graduate students, and it helps to propel them towards that unparalleled proficiency in their chosen discipline through research, their scholarly pursuits, and of course, creative endeavors. So again, this is truly a treat for me to be here. As mentioned in my introduction, I am a double alum, uh, alumna from San Diego State University undergraduate master's communication. And we are celebrating 125 years on the campus of San Diego State this year. And it's been a real treat. We started out in 1897 as a teaching college and continue to grow and, and, and rise in our rankings today. And we're so very proud as we know um, the rest of our CSU schools are doing as well. Now, I am certain that everyone here today takes pride in their university graduate programs. I know you all do. And recognizing the importance of our graduate education, my colleagues and I across the CSU campuses, trust me, we are working so hard to support research and graduate education as they truly are closely intertwined. And I know that the CSU will continue to prioritize and support research and graduate education, truly acknowledging the interconnectedness and the mutual growth. And I know that everybody here today understands the values and significance of graduate education. You are likely aware of the increased earning potential, specialized expertise, and other concrete advantages, as I call them, that come with an advanced degree. Now, just a couple of hours ago, we all enjoyed preliminary round presentations. I know I did. I was so very proud to hear from everybody. And now we are excited to move forward with the two top scoring students from each round. That's right. We present your top 10 finalists to achieve the highest scores, and they will advance now to this final round of competition as we see the finalist slide. Let's take a moment to applaud these 10 finalists. Uh, they have earned their spot in the finals after excelling in the preliminary competition earlier today and as representatives of their campus. And, and we know that their campuses are so proud. Now, it goes without saying that reaching this stage was a challenging accomplishment. And so we commend all of you, truly commend all of you for your hard work and your commitment to your field. Congratulations once again, as we eagerly anticipate your presentations this afternoon. And now we would like to take the time to review the guidelines and rules of this afternoon's exciting final session. Each of our participants today has been allowed to use only one slide to complement their presentation. And during the competition, participants will be judged based on their ability to successfully engage a non-specialist audience while communicating key details about their research in three minutes or less. 
The judging criteria for today are available for you in your event guide. As you can see, the judges are looking for clarity, organization, language appropriateness, significance, delivery, visuals, and engagement. However, students must follow the strict three-minute time allotment, which is truly a remarkable achievement. Competitors who go over that time allotment are disqualified. Now, this is a daunting task, but despite being an online event, each competitor will be presenting live, not via a recording. So you are truly in for a treat this afternoon. Before we begin the competition, I just have a few housekeeping notes that I'd like to share with you. And we know that you would all like to cheer on your participants as the chat is open for that purpose. And we've seen some, some very good cheerleaders in the chat. And I've been very excited to see the people behind uh, these wonderful, talented graduate students who are cheering them on. I, I love to see it. Please be respectful to all participants. And the way that we will proceed for each student today is that I will introduce the student who will then deliver their presentation. Afterwards, while the judges tally their scores, I'm gonna have a chat a little back and forth with our students to learn a little bit more about them and maybe even delve into some personal questions just to get to know them a little bit better. And please note that this chat will have absolutely no influence on the scoring. After the students have presented, the judges will submit their scores and the winners will be announced. And we will have a first place and a second place winner based on the judges' scores. But we also have an audience choice award or people's choice award. And the winners will be based on your votes. Information will follow on how to participate in the audience choice selection after the students present. Okay, I know our students are ready and I am sure you are all eager to see them. So let's go ahead and begin. And we are going to start with Peggy. Peggy, if you would, would you please turn on your camera and microphone and say hello? Hello. Wonderful. Okay. Are you ready to go, Peggy? I'm ready. Okay. Well, here we go, Peggy. Drowning is the number one cause of death in children with autism spectrum disorder. According to the National Autism Association, accidental drowning accounted for 91% of total U.S. deaths reported in children with ASD ages 14 years and younger from 2009 to 2011. As a person with ASD, I found that statistic to be overwhelming. I also discovered that accidental drownings were predominantly a result of wandering, which is also known as elopement. Roughly half of children with ASD attempt to elope from a safe environment. This is four times higher than their neurotypical siblings and peers. Concerns over wandering is a primary cause of anxiety for parents of children with ASD. And wandering poses an even greater risk of drowning in rural areas like Humboldt County, which offers easy access to unattended bodies of water, including 110 miles of open coastline. Swimming is an essential safety skill that also promotes fitness and is age appropriate across the lifespan. But for many children with ASD, there are barriers that can prevent them from participating in community-based swim programs. Lack of access to water safety instructors who have been trained in adapted aquatic techniques is one such barrier. Adapted aquatics utilizes techniques that emphasize swimming skills that have been modified or adapted to accommodate individual abilities. There is a real need in all of our communities for increased inclusive recreation opportunities for all individuals, including children with ASD. Adapted aquatics is a key component to inclusive recreation. The primary purpose of this program is to provide certificated adapted aquatics training to qualified swim instructors who have not previously worked with students with ASD utilizing techniques that are designed to address real world issues in an inclusive setting. The secondary purpose of this program is to generate qualitative data that will support a thesis on the effectiveness of inclusive adapted aquatics instruction for children with autism spectrum disorder. An adapted aquatics program that's focused on the needs of students with ASD will open up opportunities for families to enroll their children in community-based uh, recreation programs as well as generate data that will help to inform best practices moving forward. 
Through this program, we have the opportunity to increase safety, skills, fitness, confidence, and inclusion, decrease drowning risks, and remove social barriers for students with ASD by engaging inclusive and adapted instructional strategies that will better serve our diverse communities. Thank you. Hey. That was it. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. I was just getting to my mute, my unmute button. I wanted to give you a little time to, to wrap up and thank you. Okay. So yep. Thank right. you very much. Uh, well done. So while the judges are completing their scores, Peggy, I'd like to ask you just a, a couple of questions, if you can. I think first and foremost, from your from your presentation, what motivated you? Was there a personal experience or motivated you to pursue a study in this particular field? Well, there were a couple of things that inspired this. First of all, as, a, as an adapted physical education student at Cal Poly Humboldt, I was enrolled in an adapted aquatics program last summer, and I started doing research. And when I came across that statistic, that 91% um, statistic, it just really, um, I mean, it blew my mind. And, and as a person who has, um, uh, who has autism spectrum disorder, and I used to wander as a child and I grew up at the beach. <laughs> you know, my parents were really good about making sure that, that my sister and I were excellent swimmers. We were always on swim teams and in lifeguard training programs. And I just know that with working with students uh, with, with ASD, uh, a primary thing that I hear from parents often is, well, at least my child knows how to tread water. So my worries are just a little bit less than if they weren't able to. I mean, it's it's a it's a persistent worry for parents. Yeah, uh, certainly a, a life saving technique though, and life saving commitment. Uh, Peggy, it, it, if you don't mind, how would you share with our audience how rewarding this research has been, not only for you but for others that have maybe talked to you about how rewarding this is? Oh uh, well, this has been this has been very rewarding. I mean, I I would rather be in the water than not be in the water. Wow. So any opportunity <laughs> to go swimming is always really great, and to share that love, and now my education behind it with families and with students, it has um, it has um, just really it, it motivates me to get up get up in the morning and to work hard and to pursue this program and to pursue this thesis and really be able to share it with across communities and across settings. How much have you learned from other research done in this field that has inspired you uh, to be able to keep up the momentum with your own research? Right, well, there are several studies out that, that really demonstrate how effective um, individualized uh, instruction can be for not just children with ASD, but any child, um, with any type of uh, physical, physical or cognitive um, uh, challenges, uh, it's really it benefits across across cultures, across socioeconomic you know um, standards, and it's really swimming's a real equalizer for people. It's a real way you know time and time again. What I find in my research is that swimming really breaks down a lot of barriers. For, for all people. I mean, we think about like when we were kids and we used to go to the swimming pool, you'd make friends with somebody just for the day that you mm -hmm. just met in the pool. And this is what we want for all children, for all people is to be able to have these opportunities to go and really enjoy this wonderful uh, pastime that again, I mean, there are too many bullet points to put on my slide of all the benefits of swimming in a person's life. Mm -hmm. Peggy, thank you so much for this in incredible uh, data uh, and your, your presentation and for, of course, chatting with us and giving us just a little bit more in this off time. It appears now that our judges have entered their scores and we are ready to introduce the next competitor. And Great, next thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Peggy. Our next competitor is Jaden. Jaden, if you wouldn't mind, would you please turn on your camera and microphone and say hello to our wonderful supporting audience? Hello, my camera's a little blur or bright. There we go. <laughs> Looks great. Looks great. Okay, wonderful. We can hear you. And uh, Jaden, are you ready to go? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Well, here we go, Jaden. We all have DNA inside of us. 
that serves as instructions to make us who we are. Think of this DNA as a document and imagine one, what there, one sentence in this document is missing a key word. That sentence would be unreadable. To fix this sentence, we would need to find a way to insert that missing word. In the Johnson Lab, this is exactly what we're aiming to do with DNA. There are over 10,000 different diseases in which a single functional gene is missing. Due to this unreadable sequence, the body doesn't function as it should. If we were to insert a healthy version of this gene into an individual's DNA, they could be cured. But unlike a document, we cannot just insert a gene anywhere in the DNA. We need a safe location, a location that if edited would not result in any adverse consequences. Toward this aim, I'm evaluating a specific DNA location that could be safe for gene insertion. This DNA location determines if you have a positive or negative blood type and is called the RHD locus. For someone with the blood type A negative, for example, the gene at this location is already not functional. Yet, individuals with a non-functional RHD, uh, RHD gene are completely normal. Because we know that this DNA location can be disrupted without causing any adverse effects, we hypothesize that the RHD locus can be a safe place for gene editing. To insert a gene into DNA though, we first need to make a cut in the DNA. To do this, we are using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. CRISPR-Cas9 includes three parts. Cas9, which is a molecular scissor that cuts DNA, a guide RNA that guides Cas9 to a specific location, and a repair template that repairs the break in the DNA with the gene we are inserting. With the help of my lab mates, I constructed these three CRISPR components. We made our guide RNA match the DNA found at the RHD locus so that I can tell Cas9 to cut there. Our repair template contains a gene called GFP that glows green so that we can visually prove when it's successfully inserted. I then added these three CRISPR components to human blood cells and confirmed that the GFP gene was inserted at the right location and also functional as observed by the green glow that you can see on my slide. My next step is to repeat this process, but instead insert the gene responsible for the bleeding disorder, the hemophilia A. If successful, this innovative technique of using the RHG locus as a safe place for editing our genetic document can be applied to curing several diseases. Thank you. Jaden, thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, well thank done. You. Jade and I will tell you um, and this audience a, a bit of a, a personal nugget and then ask you an important question. This is a very personal topic for me. I am currently managing and coping, coping with a stage four cancer diagnosis for three years ago. And it was from a, a BRCA2 gene that uh, was passed on to me by my father. So this is such a critical, critical field of study, not just for cancer, but as you mentioned, diseases in general. And I'm, I'm so pleased to see your work. Please tell us uh, and help us understand how you came about in the study of this field. It's so interesting. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for sharing your personal story. Um, I joined this lab because I knew the, the PI for this lab and um, because she was also my advisor. And I just found that this research was really fascinating because I myself had family members who had bleeding dis or blood disorders. And I didn't have any real background on molecular biology. And so it was really interesting and um, uh, fascinating for me to try to challenge myself by learning this and being a part of this research. And so I joined her lab as an undergrad and continued on as a master's student. Has she been a, a wonderful mentor for you? And are there other mentors and, and advisors who have been in your, uh, your sphere that have helped you to continue to, to move forward with this? Yeah, definitely. I, I have a huge support system in my family and friends that I'm very thankful for. And my mentor, Dr. Jennifer Johnston, is a huge contributor to that. She is a great support. And I just feel so lucky literally every day that I get to be working with her because she's helped me in not only my research, but also 
my personal confidence um, with public speaking and also just going through grad school as a whole. She's in the chat and she is a one of your biggest cheerleaders, if not uh, the biggest. Uh, Jaden, can you talk about some of the challenges with this, this uh, field and, and the studies that you've actually been able to maybe overcome or that you face that you'd like to share? Yeah, so it, for me as um, someone who was more of a physiology background student, I didn't really have any um, background knowledge in the molecular side of biology. And so coming into the lab, I felt very fresh and very green and not really knowing what to expect. Um, and so there were lots of challenges with learning the concepts and also putting them out in my um, experiments and everything. And so it, it was just an awesome experience just so far as I'm just a first year grad student. And we know it will continue to be for you the rest of the way. Thank you so much for your great work, uh, Jaden. Jaden, our, our judges have entered their scores and we are ready to introduce the next competitor. Judy, Judy, would you please turn on your camera and microphone and say hi to the audience? Hi, everyone. Okay, Judy, we can hear you. And Judy, are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself and the floor will be all yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Have you ever wondered how your brain supports your ability to speak and understand language? I have always wanted to understand such links between the brain and behavior, including behaviors and skills that we are good at and those that might be challenging. As a graduate researcher at the SDSU Center for Autism, I am fortunate to be able to explore these questions by examining brain markers that can help us predict language skills, particularly in young children with autism. To provide some context, autism is a condition that affects brain development with an estimated prevalence of about one in every 36 children in the US. Children with autism often experience difficulties with language and communication, which has a direct impact on their ability to form connections with others, communicate with peers, and perform well in school. Therefore, it is essential to develop objective predictors of whether a child may be at risk for lower language skills so that targeted language interventions can be initiated early on. I was excited to be able to work with a data set that allowed me to use neuroimaging tools to map out how different areas of the brain connect in real time to support language skills. Specifically, I utilized the data set from the SDSU Toddler MRI Project, a longitudinal study of early brain markers in autism. For this project, I used a subset from the data from children with autism and typically developing preschoolers who have completed two study visits. We measured their brain connections with MRI and language performance with standardized assessments and tested for the links between the two. Interestingly, not only did our data confirm that children with autism have lower language scores than their typically developing age peers at both study visits, but we also identified a brain marker that was predictive of their later language abilities. More precisely, we found that unusually high connectivity of the posterior superior temporal gyrus, a brain region important for language processing, was predictive of lower language performance in children with autism. Now you might be wondering, what real life implications might these findings have? Well, what's so exciting and so impactful about this is that with neuroimaging, we can identify children who are at risk for later language deficits. These brain markers are present as early as 17 to 18 months of age, which is significantly younger than the average age when most children with autism begin receiving interventions. Enrolling children in targeted language therapies early on could really improve developmental trajectories and allow many children to catch up with their peers, leading to improved quality of life for the children, their families, and their communities. I would like to thank my colleagues and mentors, all the families that participated in this study and the audience for tuning in today. Thank you, everyone. Judy, thank you so much. Um, great work here and important work as are all of our participants are presenting. And, and Judy, if you can, certainly in my world as a stage four cancer patient, I understand the importance of imaging. And you just talked about um, this in the field of autism. And I'm wondering if you can help us better understand what have you found to be um, an important piece of access 
to resources like imaging in your field field of study because those, those these are the scans and the imaging that our scientists, our research physicians all need. Yeah, I'd be happy to elaborate on that. So right now with the stage that we're at with neuroimaging research for autism, there isn't any way for us to necessarily use neuroimaging to directly diagnose someone or um, maybe point to what um, challenges they may be facing uh, just through looking at their brain. So there could be a possibility that that could happen in the future, but right now um, we can't use neuroimaging for that. But what we can use neuroimaging for is to help us better understand like the way that the brain uh, connects and works differently in children with autism. And especially because lots of children with autism have very varying abilities. So um, it's possible that even within the autism spectrum that lots of people show different types of brain connections as well. So that's kind of where we're at right now. How much, Judy, are these children um, and their parents the heroes for uh, stepping in and, and being able to continue to build for future treatments um, for generations to come who will suffer from autism but may not have to suffer because of the great work that you're doing? Yeah, um, we actually work really closely with a lot of families and a lot of times um, the person that ends up actually reaching out to us is a concerned parent that may have, you know, realized, oh, I think something is wrong with my child's language development. They're a little behind um, and they have these concerns that maybe weren't detected at their um, doctor's appointments with their pediatrician. So it's really important that um, these children have the advocacy of their parents and families and support from them as well. And we do see um, how much of the difference it makes for those children. Judy, thank you so much for chatting with us. Very important work. Wishing you the best of luck um, as you continue to pursue your studies and your research. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Okay, the, the judges' scores are in, and so we're going to move on to our next competitor, Ainaria. And would you please turn on your camera and microphone and say hello? Hello. Hi, good afternoon. So wonderful for uh, to be able to see you and your beautiful face there. Uh, we can hear you and are you ready to go? Yes. Okay, here we go. When was the last time you heard a baby cry? What do you think they were trying to tell you? Humans communicate from birth if we know what to look for. A cry or face scrunch communicates an infant is tired, hungry, sick, or needs a new diaper? How would you communicate if you suddenly lost the ability to speak or were dropped in a foreign country without Google Translate? Now, pretend you're in preschool. You've learned to communicate through behavior, using vocalizations, facial expressions, and simple gestures like pulling on someone's sleeve for attention. This works, and you're understood for now, but how will you request, protest, comment, or express your feelings as you age? How can we, as communication partners, interpret those behaviors as communicative attempts and encourage more language? Augmentative and Alternative Communication, or AAC, encompasses how an individual communicates besides talking and is useful for anyone who has trouble with speech or language skills. There are two types. Unaided AAC is what you can do with your body, eye gaze, sign language, body language, and verbalizations. Aided AAC includes light tech, like a printed communication board, mid tech, like a button that says a single message like Bunny the Talking Dog, or high tech, speech generating devices that can communicate entire messages like the late Stephen Hawking. Aided language input, or ALI, is a research-based strategy in which communication partners highlight symbols in an AAC system, as they interact verbally with the person using AAC to teach language. And it looks different from person to person. Imagine playing with a three-year-old who communicates primarily through behavior, sometimes yelling or throwing items to get your attention. Let's practice the word go when playing with cars on a ramp. As the communication partner, I could say, oh, wow, I'll look at the car go. And depending on the child, use different forms of AAC to model my language signing the word go, pointing to go on a communication board, or tapping go on a speech generating device. My research collected data on one student in my classroom and focused on meaningful individualized instruction 
that followed their interests. And at the end of the research period, their expressive communication increased by 20%. If you cannot communicate, you're more likely to have anxiety and depression, less likely to have a job, and more at risk for sexual abuse. The benefits of AAC intervention include increases in language, cognition, reading, and peer interactions. Communication is a human right. All communication is valid, and everyone has the potential to communicate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Inaria, uh, beautifully done, and such important work. Mm -hmm. um, we thank you so much. And, and I have a really important question for you, Justin. What, where do you want to see this research continue to go, not just from you, but from what's happening around globally around this particular and very important topic? I would love for the intervention and instruction within the early childhood special education classroom to really shift towards really play-based instruction that really follows the interests of the child. I think sometimes in the classroom, we're so concerned about getting them prepared for the next level that we ignore that the child's job is literally to play and that's how they learn the best rather than us doing rote, rote, practicing the same thing over and over, integrating it into what they're doing and following their lead. So I would love uh, to, after I finish my teaching requirements, so I'm part of a grant and with that, I have to teach in the classroom for five years. Uh, oh. But while I'm still in the classroom, I would love to spread it uh, to other classrooms at my campus, which has already kind of started and then if we continue to be successful, maybe take this to another school or maybe district wide and continue to grow from there. Inaria, I think that we are all the lucky ones that you get to be doing this for the next five years and get to teach. And um, we know that great things are gonna come from you. So thank you so much for your important and lovely work. All right, we're gonna continue to move on as our judges scores are in and introduce our next competitor. And we have Kaylee. Kaylee, would you please uh, go ahead and activate that camera and that microphone and give us a shout out? Yes, hello. Okay, all right. We can hear you and are you ready to go, Kaylee? Yes, I am. Okay, and the floor is all yours as I mute myself. College is challenging. Students are faced with many demands in higher education, such as regulating their own schedules, collaborating with peers, taking challenging coursework, and getting experience in their field. Sports are challenging. Athletes have their own set of demands, like building relationships with coaches and teammates, developing elite physical and mental skills, and practicing or competing for up to 30 hours a week in season. Now think of the life of a college student athlete. They're faced with pressure to perform at a high level in both school and sport. They're learning information constantly and need to be highly motivated in order to have both academic and athletic success. How should they go about learning all of this information? How can they stay motivated? Do the same mechanisms apply to both school and sport? These are the questions I sought to answer in my research. Motivation. Self-determination theory states that individuals are motivated when three basic psychological needs are met. Autonomy, feeling a sense of control over what you're doing. Competence, feeling that you can do the task at hand. And relatedness, feeling a sense of belonging with others around you. These three needs should be targeted when learning new information so that a student athlete can remain intrinsically motivated, so that an athlete has the internal desire to do well. Learning style, how an individual approaches their learning. Individuals can be independent, collaborative, and participant. Approaches seen as more intrinsic. Or they could be dependent, competitive, and avoidant. These are extrinsic approaches. After surveying 234 student athletes across the nation, my results indicated that having intrinsic learning styles, being more independent, collaborative, and participant in classroom learning, is positively correlated with both academic and athletic motivation. Why? Independence leads to autonomy. Participation leads to competence. Collaboration leads to relatedness. These are interconnected. 
but it's time to use this information to aid student athlete development. Moving forward, I want to create interventions that help struggling athletes acquire self-directed learning skills, help seeking behaviors, and growth mindset. Characteristics of intrinsic approaches to learning. Emphasizing that these tools can help in both athletics and academics will help individuals succeed in both parts of their identity. Creating programs that cater to both needs is essential because college and sport at the same time, now that's challenging. Thank you. Haley, you hit a soft spot in my heart as a former college athlete. Um, well done. Congratulations on an important topic. And so, Kaylee, um, I think the, the burning question is, were, were you by chance a student athlete or played, played sports? Yes, I grew up with sports my entire life, played volleyball and softball up until high school. And then I was student athlete adjacent in college. I was in the UCLA marching band, um, so sort of had that kind of demand, but not as an intense of a level within the NCAA. Um, and currently I work with both um, athletes, both in academic and athletic spaces on Long Beach's campus, being a mental performance consultant. So like psychological skills for their sport, but also an academic peer mentor. And so now I've transitioned into this role of supporting them in both capacities. And I see the different skills kind of going back and forth between the two and thinking, you know what, why don't I just attack these at the same time? Because I'm using similar strategies in both capacities. Well, I think that's pretty brilliant. And um, I think that this field of study uh, is has developed, but it needs more people like you on it. And maybe uh, off the record, we can talk about what you're doing and maybe partner up and I can learn a little bit about more about what you're going to continue to do. Thank you so much, Kaylee, for being here today and congratulations on being one of the finalists. Thank you. All right. Okay, we're going to continue to uh, to move on and our next competitor is Cindy. Cindy, if you wouldn't mind turning on your camera and your microphone and letting us know that you're out there. Hi. Hi, Cindy, how are you? We can hear you. Can you hear us okay? Yeah, I hear everything. Okay, you ready to go, Cindy? Sure. Okay, here we go, Cindy. In my 15 years as a nurse in the neonatal intensive care unit, I've taken care of thousands of babies. The smallest premature infant I cared for weighed only 13 ounces at birth. He's pictured here on the left of my slide. Uh, many babies, particularly the smallest ones like him, need the help of a ventilator to breathe. So we put in an endotracheal tube, also called an ET tube. If the ET tube becomes dislodged, sometimes by something as simple as a cough, the resulting unplanned extubation or UE can be catastrophic. Among numerous adverse outcomes are increased length of stay, additional days on the ventilator, bleeding in the brain, cardiac arrest, and even death. As you can imagine, these complications can have devastating consequences for the affected infant and their family. Throughout my career, I've seen clinical practice evolve from accepting UE as an unfortunate occurrence to understanding that it is preventable harm. Yet currently, no detailed guidelines exist to reduce UE. So today, I'll tell you about how I evaluated the available evidence on best practices to keep ET tubes in place. To start, I did a thorough literature search for primary studies that evaluated interventions to pre prevent or reduce risk for UE in neonates. This turned up 11 source articles. Using an existing standardized rubric, I graded each article and found that while most of the available evidence is high quality, it is challenging to assign value to some practices because most studies used multiple interventions simultaneously. Nevertheless, my goal was to form more specific guidelines for practice. Looking for overlap in interventions amongst the body of evidence, I found two things I can recommend, which I outline here on the right. First is lowering the goal ET tube depth on a chest X-ray to prevent it from slipping out of the airway. Second are some specific components for a best practice prevention bundle. The bundle elements I identified are selecting and using a standardized method to secure the ET tube, requiring a minimum of two persons for patient handling, using bedside signage to communicate about UE safety. Um, and all of those together will help us to reduce UE in neonates. But there are still many opportunities for future research. Specifically, studies with rigorous experimental design are needed, and they would increase the reliability of clinical recommendations. 
In particular, we need more data to determine the best method for securing ET tubes. There are several commercially available devices and some direct taping methods, but none emerge as a clear leader in tube security. In my work as a bedside nurse, I've seen firsthand how these practices could affect a meaningful change in both unit culture and direct patient care. And every time I interact with an intubated baby, I'm reminded of the value of this research, the duty we have to our patients, and that keeping their airway safe protects their future. Thank you. Oh, Cindy, this is such heartfelt work that and studies that are done. And um, I think every parent around the, the globe who's ever had an intubated um, baby is probably thanking you uh, for this important work and insightful work. And can you uh, can you explain how this came to be? And I, I, I would guess it, as a bedside nurse, this is probably something that is near and dear to your heart, as you just mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Like I said in my presentation, like I really have seen the shift over the last 15 years where we're like, oh, this happened. How terrible to we can stop this from happening. Hmm. Um, and let's figure out how. And so there's been a lot of great, you know, kind of smaller individual site projects. And that was my task here with this one was to combine all of these individual site projects into one more global recommendation that can be applied in multiple places um, to make a difference at all facilities versus just one or two that are actively working on it. I think the the thing that you just what you just said is when you answered that question is that what you've seen how the past and an improvement and um, that you can prevent this from happening and I think when you can have that pragmatic application that is uh, is so very important um, was there ever a, a time when you've had a, a scare and that um, it it sort of you know alerted you to like we've got to fix this. Yeah, you know, I've done a lot of quality improvement work at my own uh, place of work because I work full time on top of grad school. And we initially a couple of years ago when we started, we were having somewhere in the neighborhood of like four or so unplanned extubation events for every hundred days a baby was on the ventilator. Um, and that was a really, you know, kind of high number, not the highest. If you look in the literature, there are some sites that are in double digits. Um, but we started to implement some of these things just through our own kind of like idea spitballing. And we've been able to bring that rate down to under 0.5 um, events per 100 days um, using some of the things I talked about here and then some other things. Um, in my longer paper that this presentation is based off of, I also talk about how um, it's important for sites to figure out what their own unique vulnerabilities are and incorporate that into their bundle as well on top of these core practices that I that I just spoke about. Well, Cindy, thank you so much for this important work and keep up the great work. We know that this uh, this will save lives and that this is just so important for parents to be able to continue to just love on their adorable ones. Thank you, Cindy. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Right, so our, yep, our judges uh, have entered their scores and we are ready to introduce our next competitor. And next up is Matthew. And Matthew, we would love it if you would join us by turning on your camera and your microphone and saying hello. Hi, how does my uh, audio and video sound on your end? It is wonderful. We can hear you loud and clear and hopefully you can do the same uh, with us. And are you ready to go, Matthew? Let's uh, let's get this show on the road. Okay, let's get the show on the road. I like that. Here we go. T minus three, two, one, lift off. Seeing a rocket launch is one of the most exciting things imaginable. The massive engines roar to life and breathe flame as a giant machine is launched up into the sky. Although demand for placing satellites in orbit is high, it can take years to manufacture a rocket due to the complexity of components like the engine nozzles. Some in the industry believe that we can reduce the manufacturing time and cost of these components with metal 3D printing. 3D printing can be used to produce complex shapes with much less material wastage and lead time when compared to traditional manufacturing methods. Most hobbyist grade 3D printers will use plastic wire as the feedstock and a small heating element. But at Cal State LA, we are researching a new type of 3D printing for manufacturing, which uses metal wire as the feedstock and a laser as the heat source. This process is not well understood yet and has not gained mainstream traction. 
Compared to previous types of metal 3D printers that can use an electric welding arc as the heat source, printing with lasers should be able to produce stronger components. My team and I are interested in examining which printing parameters are needed to successfully print aerospace grade stainless steel. We want to maximize our print rates because this will allow us to produce samples even faster. We do this by varying both the laser power and the printing speed. If my laser power is too low or too high for a given print speed, we can run into defects. Take a look at the 800 watt sample below. The laser power was too low for this sample, and so all sorts of little defects were created. The 1000 watt sample has a much more appropriate laser power and looks much cleaner. Through an analysis of the different printing parameter combinations, we found that higher laser powers are needed to make the higher print speeds viable. Our study does have some limitations. For instance, we've only looked at printability for one alloy family, whereas engines require all sorts of alloys to function. We do plan on looking into the mechanical properties of these samples in the future, and not just their printability. So what significance does this all have? Well, demand for orbital access continues to grow by the day, and the aerospace industry needs ways to launch satellites in a cost-effective manner. We hope that our research will help inform manufacturers what is possible with this under-investigated type of metal 3D printing, and this will ultimately result in reduced-cost rocket manufacturing. Thank you. Matthew, well done. Such a wonderful topic. Um, you know, I, I loved and enjoyed going to space camps when I was younger. And I don't know if I should ask you a question about rocket launching in space or alloys and metal, but it, it all is so important. And clearly we can understand from your great presentation, the interconnectedness. And so tell, tell me, how did you become interested in this field of study? I guess in particular, the 3D printing aspect. Okay. So Outside of my uh, master's program, I do have a full-time job. And in that position, I work as a materials engineer. Ah. And so I've actually worked on some of the valves that went in that giant rocket that you saw on the previous slide. And so in my work trying to work on failure analysis and material selection for these things, I was kind of thinking about, well, how can we produce these things better, faster, at a lower cost. And this kind of led me to Cal State LA and kind of trying to figure out how we can use 3D printing to produce some of these components. And so I'm kind of interested to see how, how this research will turn out and we can use this to kind of reduce our overall cost of building a rocket. Very fascinating uh, information there, Matthew. I, I know that moving forward, we are in good hands with your research and continued great luck to you. Uh, I'll be interested in revisiting this topic with you later on when you explore more of the alloys and learning about where uh, where that's moving to. Matthew, thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, our judges uh, scores have been entered for Matthew and we are ready to introduce our next competitor who is Haley. Uh, Haley, we would love for you to join us. Turn on that camera and that microphone and give us a hello if you wouldn't mind. Hi, Tammy and judges. Hi, Haley, we can hear you. You can hear us okay? Yep. Okay, and you're ready, Haley? I'm ready. Okay, here we go. Hi, my name is Haley Myers Dillon, and I'm a doctoral candidate in Sacramento State's EDD program. My dissertation is called Justice for Moms in College. Factors that influence student parents' degree completion timelines. My research focuses on how long it takes college students with children to earn a bachelor's degree. Sac State currently enrolls 9,000 student parents, meaning one in three Hornets has kids. It takes student parents nine to 15 years in the US to earn a bachelor's degree. At Sac State, it takes 14 years. What influences these timelines? To investigate, I conducted a mixed method study using data from 6,000 transfer students and in-depth interviews with five student parent alumni. I'm excited to share my findings. 
around inhibitors that slowed graduation timelines and catalysts that accelerated graduation timelines. This graphic representation uses arrows to show magnitude and directionality. The largest arrows have the greatest impact on time to degree. Factors at the top are associated with community college. Factors at the bottom are associated with sex state. The left side shows catalysts. The right side shows inhibitors. On the left half of the slide, brighter green arrows show catalysts in community college, and we see that at the top there, academic preparation speeds community college transfer with each whole grade point improving transfer timeline by 13 months. On the top right, community college inhibitors shown in orange show that age has far greater magnitude than gender on extending degree timelines with every year a student ages adding eight months to their transfer timeline. When a student transfers though, the inhibitors change and major has the biggest impact. Students with special majors, natural science and mathematics, and engineering and computer science majors take the longest. Qualitative findings are shown in italicized font in the arrows at the bottom of the screen. Interviews revealed barriers that inhibited graduation were life events, poor academic advising, and unavailable classes. The most impactful catalysts are community cultural wealth, childcare assistance, and community and belonging. I'm excited to share this research with you in the hopes of improving student parents' college experiences and graduation timelines at community colleges and within the CSU. Thank you. Haley, well done and congratulations on an excellent presentation on a topic that is so important in being able to close the gap, right? And, and providing uh, access and, and more and more resources, uh, as you said so eloquently at the very end, to improving the student experience, which is what we at CSU across all 23 campuses want to do is to continue that. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can help us understand how rewarding this work has been for you, because so many parents uh, are attending school. So many parents are attending school. And for me, it's been really rewarding because I work with the student parents. I get to know them, their children, their lives. Um, I help them navigate the institutional barriers um, to their degree and also plan out their, you know, their lives and their goals. We all want to help students earn um, better wages and reduce intergenerational poverty. And a bachelor's degree from the CSU is a great way to do that. Haley, I want to congratulate you on this uh, this research and thank you. And I also want to uh, mention that I noticed you, you gave a little shout out to the Hornets in your presentation, Sacramento State Hornets. And you've got a couple stingers up out there <laughs> in the chat. Uh, well done, Haley. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, our judges have uh, completed their scores and we are ready to introduce uh, our next competitor, and it is Olivia. Olivia, if you wouldn't mind joining us with your camera and your microphone turned on. Hi, good afternoon. Audio Hi. and visual looking good? Yes, everything looks good, and you can hear us okay? You can hear me okay? Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, well, if you're ready, we are ready for you. I'm ready. Let's okay. go. Here we go, Olivia. Imagine a four-year-old child starting their first day of kindergarten. They've had numerous conversations with their grown-ups about school, what it is, why they attend, but most importantly, that they'll make lots of friends. The first day of kindergarten is a huge milestone, or at least for me it was, because it was the day that changed my life. My first day of kindergarten was the day that I realized not all moms are deaf. I am a bilingual hearing child of a deaf adult, also known as a CODA. Currently, the number of CODAs that reside in the United States is unknown, but lucky for you, you have one on your screen in front of you here today. Like many bilingual CODAs, we learn American Sign Language as our first language and spoken language as our second. Yet, when we enter the K-12 through public school system, we are not provided any language support services to help us learn English, which is the primary language used in the classroom setting. CODAs are not considered English language learners. 
For my research, I'm conducting a narrative inquiry study exploring the lived experiences of CODAs, including their educational experiences. Narrative inquiry empowers individuals to tell their stories and amplifies voices that would otherwise remain silent. I am interviewing three CODAs and they plan to use their stories to change educational policy so that CODAs are no longer denied their educational rights. According to the California Department of Education, English language learners are identified when a language other than English is spoken in the home. It is then through school district assessments, if they qualify, that the student then receives language support services and or specialized programs to ensure that they are successful in their education. The protections of English language learners began in 1965 through the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. In 2011, school districts were provided guidance from the Assistant Director of the United States Department of Education stating that students whose first language is American Sign Language be considered as English only. Today, English language learners are protected through Title III of the Every Student Succeeds Act of 2015. However, CODAs are not included in those protections. Research states that by not considering CODAs as English language learners, they are being misdiagnosed and provided inappropriate services through special education or even worse, with no language supports or services at all. So why are CODAs not considered English language learners? In my experience, it's because people are misinformed. And by hearing these stories from CODAs about their educational experiences, we will be able to influence policy change in education to include CODAs so that they can receive the educational benefits that they deserve. Thank you. Hi, Tammy, I'm not sure if you're talking right now, but you're muted. Olivia, you uh, you speak with such passion and um, you are certainly convicted about this and, and it's very clear in your presentation. Can you please tell us how, um, how personal this is for you and um, just kind of where this lands in your heart because it's it comes across as very special and very heartfelt. Oh, um, it is, it's very close. Um, so I, I am a bilingual hearing child of a deaf adult. I am a CODA. Um, I did learn American Sign Language as my first language and English as my second. Uh, my mother is deaf and my father is hearing, um, but my father did work quite a bit when we were younger. And so the only uh, language model we had was my mother. Um, and so by, by doing research on CODAs, um, I'm basically identifying with their stories, with the literature that's already out there, but it's not a lot. And so I want, I want to be able to add to that research, but most importantly, I want to be able to have American Sign Language be identified as a language equal to its spoken language counterparts, but also for these CODAs that are currently in schools in 2023 to be provided the language support they need to be successful in their education. You know, I have to admit, Olivia, I don't really know a lot about this field of study and this topic. And in just your three brief minutes, I've learned um, so very much and kind of wanting to know where you want to take your next steps with this. And, and Tammy, really, that is the, the first comment that a lot of people make when I share my research um, is that they, they weren't aware or they weren't um, they, they didn't know that this was, this was happening in their classrooms. And really where I wanna go from here is to really uh, complete my dissertation work, complete my research so that way I can collect these stories from CODAs and really make a change um, in, in, the educational policy, in educational policy. Um, like I mentioned, there was guidance in 2011, which has carried forward through Every Student Succeeds Act. And it is that document that is limiting us to be included. And with every student succeeding, right now we, we have a population that's hidden, that's invisible to teachers, to educators, and we need to bring a, a light to them. What do you think it, that's going to take on a grander scale? Well, you know what? This is my life's work. So if it takes oh. my entire life to do, I will make it happen because CODAs now are still experiencing the same struggles that I had 30 years ago. And so something needs to change. And if it takes that entire time to make it happen, then I'll do it. We're still waiting for um, the judges to complete uh, their scores. Okay, just got the message that scores are in. I was going to ask you a question, but we'll we'll continue to move on. Olivia, um, I am inspired by 
uh, your work and thank you so much. Congratulations on a really, really well done presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. All right, as I mentioned, the scores are in for Olivia and we are ready to introduce our next competitor, uh, Isabella. And Isabella, if you wouldn't mind turning on your camera and your microphone and saying hello, we would be most hello. grateful. Hi, Isabella. You can hear me okay, right? Yes, I can hear. I can okay. hear. And can are you, you ready? Me? We can, yes. Uh, yes. Perfect. And are I am ready? ready to go. Okay, let's go then. Here we go, Isabella. Scorpions, blind squirrels, and newts. Three animals that you would probably never group together, but that have a fascinating trait in common. So what trait am I talking about? Well, all three of these animals can glow or biofluoresce under the right light conditions. Biofluorescence occurs when a living organism absorbs light and then reflects that light at a lower energy, which results in a glow that can occur in different colors. Last year, I found that the rough skin newt Tarika granulosa biofluoresced under blue light, which I was able to photograph using a special lens filter. The research showed a pattern of biofluorescence along the limbs of the newt and concentrated on the belly of the newt. The next step in my research was aimed at figuring out the why and how the newts have biofluorescence. If newts were using biofluorescence as a communication tool between individuals of the same species, then they would most likely demonstrate an attraction to fluorescence. I tested this in the field by using minnow traps at two different pond locations in Oregon with glow sticks as a lure. The newts would swim in one end of the minnow trap and would be trapped until they were collected the next day. Each minnow trap would have a different colored glow stick or no glow stick, and the traps would be evenly dispersed around each pawn. Unfortunately, the traps were a bust because few newts are captured. The abysmal capture rates are most likely attributed to timing. We had arrived at the ponds at the tail end of the newt breeding season, which means that there were just not a lot of newts available for capture. So what was the next step? Well, the next step involves a tank that is basically a slightly larger kiddie pool long sheets of aluminum, and a lot, a lot, a lot of rivets. My amazing colleagues helped me fashion together a Y maze out of the sheets of aluminum that we then placed inside the tank with water. I then attached glow sticks of different colors to the arms of the Y and release a newt into the middle of the Y facing a randomized direction. The newt then swims around the different sections and its movements were recorded on camera for me to analyze the time the newt spent in each section and at each glow stick. I have almost finished analyzing these trials and can say that it appears that green is the preferred glow stick color, but I will need to do further analysis to determine if this unique feature is attributed to communication between individuals of the same species. Ultimately, I hope to better understand biofluorescence because it could help us understand how newts reproduce and find mates or protect themselves from predation, which in turn may help us better understand how to protect their habitats. Thank you. Isabella, nice job. Well done. And a um, and research that is certainly important. You're getting a lot of great chats. So, Isabella, I'm I'm interested in what you can tell us about. Um, did you sort of prognosticate that that there was um going to be some more interest in that green glow stick by them, or did you really just not know? So the idea here is that since they actually glow a bright greenish yellowish color if they I I thought okay well if they are using this to communicate with one another then they must have some sort of attraction to the green color so we brought out all the different glow stick colors and we tried all the different ones and it seems as of right now the preliminary results say that um, they're attracted to the green color so that might indicate that they're using it to find each other uh for mating, for, you know, finding each other speak like uh, the same species. It could be for any of those kinds of things. Isabella, what are your next steps here with this field of study? Yeah. So originally I was thinking about passing this on to my wonderful undergrad since I'm finishing up with the master's program, but recently I've been thinking about maybe pursuing a PhD in this field. And I think that 
continuing this is very important. I think that understanding how these uh, animals communicate with one another is very important because of ecosystems. Every single organism that lives in an ecosystem has an important role to play. So if we understand how they communicate with, with one another, we can understand how to protect their populations. So that way we can protect the entire ecosystem that they live in. So I hopefully I can do some further analysis and um, maybe see if they're using it as a form of protection. Uh, so to protect themselves from predation, um, something like that, I think is it's very fascinating and there's so much more that I can do. Isabella, I think the magic words there, protecting our ecosystem, and those that's music to all of our ears, and a presentation well done by you, and good luck the rest Thank of you the so week. Okay. Well, I don't know about you, but I could say that was terrific. I feel that that is a bit of an understatement here <laughs> that we have um, really a job well done. And I hope all of you in the audience really enjoyed watching our students. Great presentation, such important, rich work um, that, that they are doing. Now it is going to take a few minutes for our judges and our judging team to verify that all the scores have been entered correctly so that we can announce the winners of this final uh, round. And at this time, I would like to share with you how you can vote for your favorite presentation. And it's the People's Choice Award. And as we move on to this, a Zoom poll will appear on your screen for you to make your selection for this important People's Choice Award, one of three awards that we have here today. Polling will be open for three minutes. And again, I'd like to encourage all of you to participate in taking this Zoom poll. As we launch this poll, you should be able to cast your vote. And now I wanna, while you're doing that, I uh, wanna talk about our prize. You can see from our prize slides today, a first place, second place, and of course the audience choice winner will be selected. Each comes with a fabulous prize. All three winners will receive a trophy that will be mailed to them. In addition, the first place winner will also receive a check for $1,200. Second place winner will receive $800 and the audience choice winner will receive $500. The seven, Remaining participants who earned their spot in this final round will receive a plaque acknowledging their achievement, and it was indeed an achievement, that will be mailed to them as well. And while we wait for the judges to continue to confer, please enjoy some of the highlights about our CSU campuses.
I just want to make sure if I can ask the judges to move into the judges deliberation room. Uh, Tracy, how do we do that? Actually, I think I'm going to move you over. I think I, we can move you over. So hang on. You're going to bounce out for a minute. I got it now. If, I, if, you, if, if I'm the only one, I can join. Okay, well, the judges' results and the People's Choice winners are in. So let's go ahead and get just give us. Just need another minute. We we are just prettying up the slide. Slide. Okay. Give us one second. Sure, of course. That's pretty good, pretty good jump drum roll.
Congratulations to the People's Choice winner, Judy Mavalji from San Diego State University. Thank you, everyone. Yes, congratulations. And you're getting some, some love in the chat. And great work by you, Judy. Very, very important. Okay, our second place winner is, and we'll pause for that drum roll again. Matthew Enquist, Los Angeles, congratulations, Matthew. Very, very proud of you. Matthew, if you wanna come on and give a shout out, congratulations. I just wanna say thank you to everyone and my, and my PI and my, uh, my lab mate. It's actually, they made everything, uh, everything possible, so thank you. Well, I'm not surprised that you're giving uh, pointing credit to other people. That just seems to be the way of this group of students, and that's why we love you guys. All right, we are ready for our first place winner. Let's pause for that final drum roll. The student who wins the competition first place is... Jaden Rollins, San Jose State University. Jaden, are you there? Can you turn on your uh, camera and your mic? Yeah, hi, thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Well done. Well, well done. Congratulations. And if all of our winners would like to activate the cameras and wave just to be acknowledged by our audience, please go ahead and do so now. Congratulations once again, a big round of applause for all of our participants. And of course, congratulations to the winners, but I want to congratulate all of the participants here today that participated in this morning rounds and then in the final competition. I can tell you the judges' jobs were very, very difficult because of the collective excellence of presentations and work. And you can tell by the presentations today that there have been, uh, I don't wanna say tireless hours because I'm sure you're all tired, right? Uh, but incredible work behind uh, uh, the work that you're doing and the research, but it is the passion, the conviction in which you brought forward today that I think is most impressive to all of us. So once again, congratulations to all of the participants in the CSU Grad Slam. And before we conclude, I want to acknowledge like in every event and every activity that happens, the large number of people across this CSU system that came together to make this event a reality. And I know that in the past, this has been hosted by other universities, but on behalf of San Diego State University, I know that when the baton gets passed, there's a lot of work, there's a lot of tutorials that go into this and training the next group to be the host. Um, what a wonderful shared and collective effort it has been. I also want to uh, give a shout out in particular to Dr. Tracy Love. Um, and everybody, but in particular, Dr. Tracy Love for inviting me to, uh, to moderate. Uh, first and foremost, thanks and congratulations again to the student participants. I mentioned that it's your deep, comprehensive understanding, I think, of your subjects, but your energy and your grace that make us all so proud to be associated with the CSU system. Heartfelt appreciation to our esteemed Judges and the moderators all day today, uh, they brought us invaluable presence and expertise, which truly made this event possible. Thanks also should be mentioned to the members of the events steering committee who spent months planning this grad slam. We are also incredibly grateful for the chancellor's office for sponsoring this very important event. And of course, a huge shout out and a big thank you to the logistics, well, we'll call them magicians or sorcerers, who pulled everything together. Uh, this was a hardworking team of people dedicated to making this experience for everybody a nice one. But I especially wanted to thank Pat Walls for going above and beyond the call of duty to make this event a success. And of course, once again, our fearless leader, Dr. Tracy Love. Finally, thank you to the Chancellor's Office and San Diego State University for providing important and much needed funding so that this event can happen. 
but it wouldn't have been the case today that this would have been so exciting as we have seen all morning and this afternoon to our audience. The shout outs, the great positive feedback, the backing that our students have, the mentorship, family, friends, everybody coming together. What a great showcase of student research and creativity across the CSU. We hope that you have enjoyed being part of this third annual CSU Grad Slam. If you would, please take just a few minutes to provide your feedback on the event. And you can do that by emailing us at CSU hyphen grad hyphen slam at sdsu.edu. We certainly look forward to seeing you all at next year's Grad Slam. Thank you again, everyone. It has been an honor, a pleasure to be your moderator here today. I am Tammy Blackburn. Congratulations to all the winners. Have a wonderful rest of your Friday, a safe, healthy, and happy weekend. Thank you.